Welcome to Pot and Market. Uh, I have here with me today Noelle Lorraine Williams. Um, she's here to discuss uh, an opening that's going on on April 17th, uh, Wednesday, yes. um, involving Frederick Douglass Field over at Rutgers. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, Noelle. Uh, we, um, just to give you a little brief background, I'll have Noelle describe herself more in detail, but um, she's an artist, uh, a graduate student at Rutgers, and a resident of Newark, New Jersey. And uh, I'm just going to throw it over to Noelle to sort of go into her own bio and describe what she does. Awesome. <laughs> uh, good morning, Manny, and good morning, everybody. It's awesome to be here in the studio. My girlfriend's here. The sound engineer is here. And it's just a great Saturday morning in Newark. Really beautiful. Um, I am Noelle Lorraine Williams. I am an artist here in Newark. Um, I'm also a graduate student at Rutgers University, Newark. Um, I'm also um, a teaching artist and researcher and curator at Newark Public Library. So I guess some people say all black everything is <laughs> all Newark everything for me. Um, I was originally born in Jersey City. We moved over here to 16th Avenue and 21st Street, uh, maybe when I was about 11 years old. And so, but even before then, my mom used to come shop downtown Newark. We used to come to Bamberger's Basement. Oh, man. <laughs> and get some choice, choice gear. I mean, I, I used to wear colors apparently when I was younger that I don't wear now. So it was awesome. Uh, out of interest, what colors were those? I actually bought like a pink and white and green jacket that was That's like a so nineties. Yes, and funny. a pink purse. I was looking at the picture. <laughs> it's cool. So yeah, so I had an experience of Newark, um, even while I lived in Jersey City. And you know, one of my questions, I actually. As an artist, I have a series from 2006 that I actually did with Stafford Woods called Isolation Refreshed. Um, that's actually right near here, near the Pot and Market Studios. Um, before they actually started doing work on Teacher's Village, I have this imagery where this activist wakes up um, 40 years later after the Newark Rebellion. And she's like, where did everybody go? <laughs> what happened? You know, um, and so that was actually big based on how I felt as a young kid growing up in Jersey City, taking the bus here to Newark and kind of wondering like what like what happened? What are these empty lots? Why do we have empty lots? Why do we have all these empty spaces? Why do we have these kind of busted in stores? And as a kid I didn't understand why you know, we had them. So like this art piece um, was based on translating those emotions. Wait, did, the, did it have a title, that piece? Or? Yeah, it's called Isolation Refreshed. It's a series of black and white images. Um, I have on a white turban and a white dashiki. It's like, it's futuristic because all the color has been drained out. Mm. And then I wake up two blocks from here. I could share it with you. Also, and it's on my website, yeah. noellelorainewilliams.com. Yeah, and that'll, that'll be shared in the show notes. <laughs> so if you're, um, we'll be sharing a lot of uh, Noelle's pieces on the, on the podcast website. Awesome. Um, so let's talk about the project that's um, opening up on Wednesday. Yeah, so thank you for inviting us to talk about the Frederick Douglass Project. Um, we're going to be having a ceremony on Wednesday, April 17th at 2.30 p.m. over there on um, University Avenue and Warren Street. Um, the mayor is going to be there. The council people will be there. Um, a representative for court, Senator Booker will be there. Uh, we're going the Phil and Monica orchestra has commissioned they've created a piece for it they actually offered a year wow. ago um so they're going to be doing a couple of pieces with a quartet um and it should be a, a very monumental day um some of the descendants from the folks who actually lived in that black abolitionist community they'll be there too um so could you actually just to and um 
orient our, our listeners, what is going on in that field? What, what is the history of that field? Yeah, so it's really exciting. Um, what's going on in that field is that that field was almost what I've come to learn in my research, kind of the center of black activist work in, of New- in Newark during the 19th century. So I guess if we were to think of the period from like the 1820s, all the way up to the 1880s, we have a concentration of black folks. There's um, two churches, one church where we now call University. It used to be called Plain Street. Um, And another church that was actually located in an Essex County parking lot, um, right over there by Raymond Boulevard. And um, there's also one of the only documented underground railroad stops in Newark, even though as we're coming to do more underground railroad research in the United States, what we're seeing is that there were multiple places that were underground railroad Mm -hmm. stops and that it was kind of like a changing, mutable thing um, that in sometimes some places were, and when it was too dangerous, they weren't. But right there at that site on the field was the King House right on Warren Street, and they were an underground railroad stop. They were also a part of this organization. It was called a Relief Association. Um, and that, those were folks who raised money for um, fugitive enslaved. Um, so those, just to run with the Underground Railroad um, mm-hmm. piece, uh, in terms of the history of Newark, was Newark merely a stop? Was it a destination point for fugitive slaves? Um, Do we know, like, did a lot of them end up staying in Newark, or do they move on to places like Canada, or do, I mean, what, do we know much about the post-history? This is, this is all new research, meaning, uh, what I'm doing is I'm bringing together bits and pieces of stories that have been written for over the past 40 years, right? So, um, Gigatano, he wrote some stuff. Mm -hmm. Charles Cummings wrote some stuff. So, basically, what my project has been is it's almost like a remix, right? Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, I'm like, hold up. So, you know, this person's telling this story, this person's telling this story, but there's a stronger narrative here. Now, one of the things, and I'm happy you brought this up, Manny, is that for some people... Newark became a place to stay for freed freed African Americans. There were still a couple of enslaved African Americans mm-hmm. here in Newark. But one of the things a lot of people don't know about Newark is that it was the seat, one of the seats of the American Colonization Society. For, oh, yeah. Yeah. So folks who don't know about it, the American Colonization Society was a union of white slave owners. <laughs> And what we would call liberal whites who were working together to figure out a quote end quote solution for freed African Americans. And why did they need this solution? Because they felt that the United States could never be a home right. for free African Americans. <clears throat> One of the questions that came up in my research is here in Newark, you have people like Samuel Cornish, you have Dr. Payson, and I was like, why is someone like Theodore Freelandhausen, you know, Mm -hmm. working with the American Colonization Society to get freed blacks in Africa? You know what I'm saying? Uh, Just a quick footnote. I just want to describe because there's a few names that were dropped in there. Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, So Theodore Freelandhausen... um, uh, is part of a political dynasty that was very yes. powerful in New Jersey, a Dutch family that um, actually still, t- up till last year, yes. which is insane to think <laughs> about, from the 1700s to last year, had a family member from New Jersey in Congress. Yes. Um, and he has a statue over in Military Park. His nephew. Oh, his nephew. So it's not Theodore himself, but it's yes, his nephew. Yeah, but it's a family legacy. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a dynasty. Um, so I just wanted to put that footnote for those who didn't know who are listening. Yes, and his nephew was actually a part of the American Colonization Society as well. Mm-hmm. It was a family, a family tradition, I guess you could say. Um, and... I I didn't understand it, right? I'm like, he's around all these intelligent African-Americans. Why does he want them to go to Liberia? And we realized the reason why the American Colonization Society is so strong in D.C., in Newark, is because what they're seeing is that there will be African-American agitation for as long as there are free blacks, right? So the American Colonization Society then becomes 
a response to African Americans asserting their rights in cities like Newark, Brooklyn, DC, Philadelphia. We have this burgeoning community from the 1820s on, and they're like, we cannot coexist. So some of the solutions were like, send them out to the Midwest, (laughs) other solutions. And so Liberia becomes the most beautiful solution to present to audiences. So they have a major meeting right here, a block away from the studios at First Presbyterian Church, where they've raised thousands of dollars for the American Colonization Society. Um, yeah, and just another quick footnote, just to explain, uh, the American Colonization Society, they're, um, mo- they're not model, but they're, they're organizing um, principle was, um, th- and this occurred before emancipation, this idea yeah. that um, the solution to the problem of slavery was simply to send um, African Americans back, or I say back with yeah. heavy, heavy, heavy quotes that you can't see me right now. I'm like, literally, my fingers are going up and down um, to Africa <laughs> because they, I mean, from what we know, uh, the slaves were brought from pretty much every single part of sub Saharan Africa, mostly from West Africa, but all parts. Um, but they would send them to the one piece of land that wasn't really claimed by any European power, which is Liberia. Yeah. Um, and that was part of a larger project uh, over the course of decades. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, um, by emancipation, the American Colonization Society pretty much is over. I mean, like, it, emancipation really throws yeah. a loop for that, right? Well, the, their their project was an expensive project. Yeah. You know, it, it required lots and lots of money. Um, and... You know, even the way Liberia was acquired, I think, I think, and you know, audience, please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I mean, the way Richard, the way it's told that Richard Stockton acquires it is he takes a gun to the head of an African and, you know, an African chief and threatens him <laughs> to get the plot, right? So my point is, is that these stories are kind of soaked in um, blood, colonization, and um, the imprisonment and segregation of African Americans, you know. And it's important for me in this story to explain that, you know. Um, There were African Americans who did want to go to Africa. What we also need to also understand about the whole concept of going back is that many of these African Americans who they were trying to send back had been in this country for two, three, four, five generations at this point, right? So they weren't even going back. And matter of fact, in the early 19th century in Philadelphia, thousands of African Americans got together and they had a protest about it. They were like, we're we're against the colonization um, scheme. They called it a colonization scheme. Um, Samuel Cornish, who's actually based here in Newark, he writes an essay that's published right here in Newark, um, near Broad Street, and it's a 30-page um, explanation of why blacks do not want to go back to Africa. Now, this does not mean that there aren't some who believed in emigration, mm-hmm. right, which was black folks um, deciding how, how and when they would go back, which also had its own problems, right? But with the ACS, one of the problems was they weren't inviting African Americans to have this dialogue with them about how African Americans could go back. It was basically like a white supremacist project to have a white supremacist goal, and that was to eradicate black activism in the United States. Because, like, they believed, they said, you know, the blacks will never give us peace. Once we free them, and you know, like I always say, they were right. <laughs> well, it's funny. Like I would, go, I would go a step further. We didn't give them peace. Yeah. <laughs> decade after decade. Yeah, I know. And the funny thing is, I, I would go a step further. I think the ACS, and granted, they were not the entire like they didn't represent the entire white supremacist structure um, of, of, or I want, let me put it in better terms. They were just one aspect of a larger project of having to deal with what many called the black problem, right, of, like, dealing with this large population uh, that mm-hmm. at one point was enslaved, but then would eventually become emancipated, um, yeah. and what to do with them. Um, so I want to just come back to the field itself. So what's yes. going on in that field today? Like, what is um, that space going to be? So basically, the mm-hmm. field is 
alumni field, sports field um, at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. And basically, it'll still be a sports field, but now it's going to be named Frederick Douglass Field, right? Now, um, it's going to have a monument that I'm designing um, that's going to be near the field. It's going to be a facade of Frederick, De Frederick Douglass's face when about the period that he came to Newark. And then the background is going to be nine stories about African-American um, history here in Newark. So, for example, like Reverend Weeks is um, when he tries to go to a church on Academy Street, Fourth Presbyterian Church. And he's like, I want to tell you guys, you know, as a part of the anti-slavery society. And I read their notes. One of the things they were doing was they were supposed to go to churches and tell the whites, <laughs> their white congregants, you know, um, it's wrong to um, enslave people. And it's wrong to discriminate against black people. So you're supposed to do that. So Reverend Weeks did this action. And basically, first hundreds of people revolted against it. And then it grew into a crowd of thousands, for those of us from Newark, imagining thousands of people on Washington Street is like a crazy thought anyway. And they basically tore down the church. Mm. So those are some of the stories I'm going to convey as a part of the field. Um, so what the field is going to become is a marker, right? Um, it's, it's a marker. And then we have other projects at Rutgers, the Clement Price Institute, mm -hmm. my own project, that's going to enliven the space around it, right? So the Clement Price Institute, they're doing interactive type things. I'll do like a history and a tour type thing. Um, and what will happen there is we'll start to kind of engender this place, um, with the stories of folks who came before, but these stories of activism, courage, and, you know. So I, I want to ask a quick question. Um, and yeah. I say this knowing full well the importance of Frederick Douglass yeah. to both, I mean, just American history. Forget, I don't know who needs to qualify as African American history because mm -hmm. honestly, he's a huge deal. Yeah. Like going to temperance, you know, um, to women's rights. He was at Seneca Falls. Yeah. Um, why Frederick Douglass, who I associate with having been born in Virginia, I think, uh -huh. uh, and spent a lot of his time dying in Washington, D.C. itself, but he had gone across the world. He mm -hmm. um, he was an activist in a lot of places, but I don't think of him as a Newark yeah. figure. So why, why name the field after him? So, okay, first it's because the church, Plain Street Colored Church, was on that field, mm -hmm. right? So what we're doing, so the church that Frederick Douglass came to Newark to visit is on the field. Um, and so when we found this out, right, Todd Allen is the one who identified this. Um, he works with the Frederick Douglass Initiatives and he shared it with the chancellor. And then I contacted the chancellor about sharing about black, New York's black abolitionist history. So what happens is through Frederick Douglass coming to visit and the existence of this community, it becomes an opportunity to educate the public and also mark the space of black empowerment. So you understand, so even though we don't connect mm -hmm. Douglas to like Newark or Jersey City, any of these places he visited, um, it, it becomes a part of, if we've been thinking about monuments in this country deeply for the past three years um, in spaces, Right. Um, so like you mentioned earlier, there's a statue for Freeland Heisen's um, nephew in the park. Right. Is that through this renaming process, we're reimagining these spaces. So it's not like Douglas had a studio there. He worked there a lot. It's that he came to visit. He probably visited a couple of times. He, we're coming to find out he came to Newark quite a few mm -hmm. times. Um, but that we're marking black empowerment in Newark and also the tradition of um, writing and reading as liberation, right? So Douglas came to the church, you know, he gave a speech, he was promoting his paper, The North Star, right. you know. And this is also the site where Samuel Cornish is publishing. Where, and let me explain, and I'm sorry I didn't explain this to the audience earlier, when we think of black churches during this period, they're not just um, places where people go and worship. Mm. At that site, that was a school for girls. 
you know, it was pro- most likely a site to like gather clothes for the Underground Railroad. This was a place where they had political meetings. Um, I think by the time we get to what 1834, the Colored American Anti Slavery Society is meeting in that church, right? So the way you should think and the audience should think of African American churches and Plain Street Colored Church is almost as like an activist center. Yeah. You know, um, so just to be clear on that. Yeah, that's and it's really cool that um, I mean, obviously it's a sports field and it has some use now, but it's not. Um, it's great to actually make that previous history that of that space actually come to life with, you know, a picture of Frederick Douglass and these stories. Sur- they'll be surrounding the field. Like, where will these no, stories no, be? No, no, it'll be the marker. It's going to be on the corner it's going to be on the of the corner field, corner. and the field is being renamed. So. You know, I think someone said in the meeting, you know, what an amazing thing to, like, go look at a map of Newark and see something called the Frederick Douglass Field, you know. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, I think of what we need to think of this the this initiative as is as these um, monuments and reclaiming space. It's a part of that dialogue. So y- thank you for mentioning that because this is a connection I didn't make until you started talking here on this uh-huh. podcast. Um because it's a, it's it's fresh in my mind. I follow these stories, but I don't think of it here. Mm-hmm. Because you know, if you walk to Military Park, you don't see a statue of Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis. Yeah, you see a statue of Carney, who died famously as a cavalry officer, or he didn't die. Sorry, I think he survived the war. But oh no, no, he no, he did die in the war mm-hmm. um, in a charge. Um, and so this idea of Confederate monuments is not as sh- not as physically present up here. But could you talk about? You said a dialogue. Like what is. You know, what is the connection between naming a park, or not a park, um, a space, Frederick Douglass Field, and the conversation that's going on in cities like New Orleans, like Atlanta, yeah. where these statues are being dealt with? Yeah, I think, um, I think what's happening in the, in the north, right, um, and this has happened in Brooklyn, they recently did a project called Abolitionist Brooklyn, mm. where they're talking about abolitionists, white and black abolitionists in Brooklyn who were working in similar spaces. So Dumbo, Fort Greene, right? Um, So what's happening now in Newark, what I'm hoping to do, right, is we're rethinking our spaces. And I'm happy, you know, I was just listening to you talk about, like, the monuments. I love, this is what's so great about conversation is it sparks these things. So let's, let's imagine our visual as we're walking through downtown New York, what are the monuments right. conveying? So we see a cannon, right, from the Spanish-American War. So what does that create in the space that we are a military space? It's called Military Park. It's shaped like a sword. You know, what does that say about the city? What does that say about this country? Mm-hmm. You know, and then... Um, the, oh, I have to mention something very quickly. The, yeah. I, I love what they've done with the sword. Um, you can really see it. I, I, I used to live on the 20th floor of 1180. Yeah. Now I live on the 4th, so it's not as clear. But um, it's filled with flowers now, which is like a sort of like, it reminds me of the 60s. And like, yeah. there's just like, um, it's also very evocative to um, my parents' background. So um, it is April. April 25th is, um, is a huge deal in Portugal. It is the only, I know in history, the only military led coup that was specifically there to install a democracy, which oh. is a crazy thing to think about. But one of the most evocative images of that coup in uh, April 25th, 1974, is um, people in Lisbon putting carnations in the barrels of guns. Yeah. As oh, a sort that's of, where that image comes yes, from. Yes. Well, I mean, it's associated, it actually had been associated <laughs> with uh, Americans in uh, fighting Vietnam, like, you know, protesting Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, Portugal was going through its own Vietnam in, in Angola oh. and Mozambique at the same time. Okay. So that was a very, there was a much of a dialogue that was going on, uh, despite it being a very repressed society, unlike America, where people could still speak freely. Um, but the idea of placing flowers and guns makes me think of po- putting these beautiful flowers that particularly in spring bloom with all these colors in this sword shape, which is really hard to see on the ground level. But if you look from above, it's a very evocative, almost like a, this, this idea of changing spaces and, yeah. and being in dialogue. Like, yes, there's a sword there. We don't need to necessarily eliminate the sword. But the sword is now filled with flowers, right? This, like, yeah. you know, reclaiming space kind of thing. Yeah, but it also, the park is still called Military Park, not Peace and Freedom Park. Of course, yeah. And that's kind of like, 
the with the monuments, what comes up, right? So mm-hmm. Theodore Freelancer, even though he create he gave a lot a lot, the nephew mm-hmm. gave a lot to the community, there's a statue for him there. But there's not a statue for Kenneth Gibson. They just barely got the statue for Dr. King a couple of years ago. Yeah. You know, there's not a statue like my professor pointed out of Samuel Cornish. You know, Samuel Cornish lives here in Newark. He founded the Colored American, which is the first mm-hmm. national black newspaper. You know, um, there's not a statue for, um, I can't, his name escapes me now, but he fought in the Revolutionary, he's African American who fought in the Revolutionary War. And then even if we keep, continue to walk down the street, yeah. there's a gigantic statue of George Washington in Washington Park. And George Washington owned, as we know what, 160 uh enslaved people, right. um, and that might be off, I'll correct it. But the whole thing is, what does our visual environment convey to us? What does it mean? A military park, a cannon, these these um, white men who support particular structures. So by doing the Frederick Douglass Field, or even the field, my, my friend who um, passed away last year, Jerry Gant, worked on mm. the Nat Turner Park, right? Yeah. These are all um, moves to engender the spaces with African-American ideas of power. So it's funny because when you mentioned uh, Washington Park, the other statue I thought of, like Washington's obviously a controversial figure, but he has some redeeming, not redeeming, but um, uh, that's not actually a a word I should use at all, but um, he has these qualities that were also interesting and could be learned from this idea of like restricted Mm -hmm. power and, and his role as a president. The problem is his glaring personal fortune um, was built on on um, slaves, you know, running this uh, plantation down in Virginia. But there's another figure in that park who um, I think it is generally regarded as an awful human being, but is so important to a particular group, <laughs> and that's Christopher Columbus. Yes. Um, and that is where the, I think the conversation gets very interesting, where yeah. the jury... And the, I don't want to say the jury is still out, but you have... He's such an important figure to the Italian American experience, just because his yeah. his life symbolizes an Italian literally coming to the New World. Um, my my personal preference of replacing would be like Garibaldi, who I think has a similar like he came to the New World. He actually mm-hmm. lived in Staten Island, which is oh. a crazy story, but was also like a revolutionary who wanted a a united Italy and a republican Italy, which ended up not happening um, hmm. until much later. Interesting. Um, but you know, what do you do when the space? has two meanings or has two interpretations, mm-hmm. right? One where one group sees it as an affront to their, um, to their identity, to their story, to their heritage, whereas another group sees it as a celebration of their yeah. heritage. I mean, this does, sounds like the Confederate argument, but like, <laughs> um, you know, how do you negotiate that conversation? I don't, necessarily, I don't want a solution per se, but I, want, I wonder how do you talk about spaces when you do run into the problem? Well, like Frelinghuysen, like, yeah. you know, questioning his role, the family's role in the American colonization society, but also yeah. realizing that the family did represent this state for many years, was on the Republican side of, um, or the Union side of the Civil War. Like, how do you deal with those issues? Well, first, I want to say the Confederacy argument is trash. I mean, mm-hmm. and scholars have spent a lot of time doing op-ed, publishing pieces over the last two years, so we can understand that the Civil War was about slavery. You know, in the South, they keep pushing this mythology that it was about statehood and um, folks being autonomous, and they're always pushing this, like, Southern culture of freedom, and we represent the best of the United States. But it was about slavery. I mean, Ta-Nehisi Coates did an essay in The Atlantic where he's literally writing for seven pages how each state what their position was before they entered the war. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, but as far as other spaces, like with Columbus, it just brings us, as an American studies scholar, it brings us more into how these cities are constructed for various ethnicities. So if we're understanding whiteness, right, and we're understanding being Italian or Irish where you're not really considered white enough, you're not, you're considered to be, um, kind of, you know, um, being dispo- being perceived as disposable, expendable. In a lot of the narratives of these cities, someone like Christopher Columbus 
becomes a symbol of the power of your community, right? So there's an emotional connection to it within the realm of us understanding race in the United States. But since there aren't that many Italian scholars, thinkers, <laughs> activists who are saying, hey, y'all, let's think about our relationship to whiteness um, and our relationship to colonization and our relationship to domination. Um, that conversation hasn't really been enmeshed in how Italian Americans are thinking about statues of Christopher Columbus, right? Mm -hmm. No one's really saying, you know, I understand that they treated your great grandparents, your grandparents like crap, disposable labor, you know, and that those are the feelings that are undergirding this Christopher Columbus debate. I mean, even on The Sopranos. Yes, that that's, I love that episode. No, no, there's a. It's uh, a and I, I love it. It's it's a passionate scene because there are ready people are ready to get down. You know what I'm saying? Uh, just to, like, just fight. yeah, just to quickly uh, go in. There's a, a Sopranos. A, a show I probably pitched on this podcast before, but an amazing show to watch just to get under, understand New Jersey culture, but also the insanity of like conflicts that occur in New Jersey. There's an episode where um, there's a Christopher Columbus Day parade yeah. that's going to happen, and a Native American group is going to protest it because of their um, their views on Christopher Columbus's legacy, and it ends up devolving into this like insanity, and then like you know this like at one point. Uh, the, the the dirtiest tactic they pull is pro is showing that the that famous tearing Indian from the seventies is actually an Italian American guy, it, it, which oh. is a true story. Um, I don't know if there's a famous ad from the nineteen seventies where there's a, a guy throws a piece of garbage and you see this you know Indian with a single tear, um, you know, sort of coming down his face, and uh, it turns out this guy was actually an Italian American who masqueraded himself as an Indian, a Native American, sorry, oh. and. Uh, this man actually kept saying he was Native American until he died, and his daughter continues this. Wow! Um, despite like almost uncontrovertible evidence, I mean, I th from what I my opinion is uncontrovertible, but I think there are people still discussing this no. evidence that he was the, an Italian American man um, who was just claiming this heritage. No. But this is like a fascinating episode about like identity and like, it's particularly in New Jersey where Italians also both see themselves as like. A group with proud heritage, but also weirdly as an oppressed group because it's how they've defined their narrative. Yeah. And to run with that, um, there's a show I want to recommend that's out right now. Uh, Henry Louis Gates, um, who uh, did this um, four-part documentary on PBS called Reconstruction. Yeah, my mom taped it for it's, me. It's, so what I love about Reconstruction <laughs> is academia talks about it a lot. The legal community talks about it because we have three important amendments that come out of that period. Yeah. But pop culture doesn't enough, right? There's no public, you know, popular space to talk about it. And... To go back to say, ident this identity thing, what, one thing I, I'm often told the story that, like, you know, the idea of the Confederacy as the lost cause is a constructed narrative by uh, the wealthy elites of the South. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it's bought, and this is kind of an interesting conversation because we could talk about it here in Newark as well, mm -hmm. is a lot of poor whites in the South bought this idea because they went through five, four years of unbelievable carnage and they, and Massive economic change, too. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the South basically starved to death, yeah. you know, in this yep. war. Um, and to starve to death for something that basically the entire world, except for two other countries, which are still practicing slavery at the time, um, was thought was a moral wrong, they had to rationalize it some other way. So they, they, they had to figure out a way to, like, explain these four years of just losing, you know, brothers, cousins, fathers, sons, you know. And I highly recommend the documentary because it talks about the sort of psychology of what's going on in the South in eight, from 1865 to the 1880s and even further, right, yeah. to today with, with uh, you know, people still, you know, talking about, you know, Lee, General Lee as being this figure that they admire. Yeah, and I, I totally look forward to watching it. My mom said she, yeah. she taped it or something for me, whatever that means these days. Um, but as, as people tend to forget, African Americans also died in the Civil of War course, yeah. and they didn't have to... They didn't have to fight. Um, and a lot of the deaths, as you know, in the Civil War were from infectious diseases and other things. Um, another, like, as far as people actually getting murdered. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting, the mythology that's developed around the Civil War. Um, in Newark, 
you know, was in a precarious position. Um, like Newark, just to respond to your question earlier, it wasn't really a safe space mm-hmm. for African Americans. Newark was in the leadership of Newark. All of the mayors were definitely committed to trying to um, have a position of, um, they tried to make it seem like they could not really make judgments about slavery. Um, Their argument was that slavery started in the North, so how dare we in Newark actually judge slavery? But one of the reasons is because almost 75% of Newark's income before the Civil War was coming from the South, right? Mm -hmm. So you have people like the Grimke sisters, white other white abolitionists and black abolitionists who are like, Newark is problematic, we need to take a stand on it. And the leaders here in Newark are like, no, you know, um, most of our economy comes from the South. So it's a really interesting place for um, black activists and the black activist family. I mean, they had, I I think by the 1830s, there's about a million dollars of wealth with African-Americans here in Newark. And that's, that's in the 1830s. And that's with, you know, only kind of like 800 people. So there's a couple of families that have wealth who are actually trying to push this fight and develop the community and have schools and everything for folks. So when Frederick Douglass comes here, you know, there's the black community is able to welcome him, but he's also stepping into a city that um, where the leaders, like Freeland Heisen and William Halsey, right? Mm-hmm. So the street is named from the Halsey family. And the Halseys were colonizationists, you know what I'm saying? And it's named after someone who wanted to send African Americans back to um, Africa. Not back to Africa, to Africa, just right. to destabilize activism here, you know? And then it's also a place where they're like, you know, in meetings I have from the archives, I found this whole discussion at a meeting where activists like Grimke are coming in and they're like, you know, you guys need to divest from the South. What they're talking about in the 19th century is what we knew in the 80s, or I don't know about Manny in the 80s, (laughs) but, you know, divesting from South Africa. When I was young, it was like, you know, free South Africa, you know, they people were shutting down universities, other places, divest. And they're doing that in the 19th century. So they're coming to meetings here, and they're like, we can't trade with the South anymore. You guys are making whips in Newark factories, as you guys might not know. Newark was famous for its, like, tanneries, carriage making, leather places. And, the, you know, and I, in the meeting, you know, the mayor says, we make whips to sell to people, but these whips, we can't decide what people do with their whips. All right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean that's I mean, so, so what you're speaking to is also like just the the I think what's kind of lost in a lot of people is just sort of the complete integration of the two economies between we often divide the north economy as being industrialist yes. and the south being ag- ag- agrarian agricultural plantation based but like one was sort of feeding the other I mean it was you know uh, raw goods going from the south up to the north and north was manufacturing them and the north yep. also sending down food to the south which you know wasn't producing as much food because they were devoting land to Cotton to sugar to yeah. indigo to rice to to all these like sort of uh, commodity luxury goods. Um, yeah, but what I'm also speaking to is ideology, right? That too, yeah. About how uh, that's do it. most importantly, and that's what the renaming of monuments is about, right? Mm-hmm. Is showing people what's happened before, how it impacts us now. And what are the conversations we can have about power and people and race um, in these cities, in Newark, in Brooklyn, in Philadelphia, you know? Um, I just want to uh, just talk about a little bit of the logistics yeah. um, of, of doing this. Um, you know, what buy-in did you have? What Did you get pushback or were, were there questions about how this should be done? Um, could you go just a little bit into that yeah. process? Well, initially this project started because I wanted to mark African American, what I called African American places of power in Newark, right? So Newark had a black hospital. It was called the Kenny Hospital. It was started by an African American and it had black doctors and nurses. And, you know, the building still exists on West Kenny Street. So I did a proposal where I wanted to mark that, three other sites, including the Underground Railroad site, 
with like 15 foot um, photographs of these people who worked in the spaces. My, my commitment and my work with history and art and public monuments is how do we share this information with the public? These places that seem silent, but that are filled with stories, how do we convey it to the public? So one of the things with that was with the Kinney Church was I wanted to do a large oversized photo on the outside of the building of these black doctors and black nurses. So when people are driving by, they're like, who are these black doctors and black nurses? They learn more about the space and their ideas for people who live in Newark in particular. Their ideas about Newark and power and empowerment become important, right? Also for Queen of Angels Church, I wanted to show how it was a group of African-American women who were trying to build uh, a, a space of refuge for black women coming from the South. That's how the church, how, that's how they came together. These were black women who cared about younger black women in the early 20th century. So we, all, we keep having these narratives in Newark of dispossession and lack of care by African Americans about one another. That really does, um, in a lot of ways, um, feed the different narratives about who's cared for, who doesn't get cared for, what we can deal with, um, whether we have non-unionized jobs or what's, what's actually taking care of Newark. And I think as far as like with the Frederick Douglass field, so when I came to that and I wanted to propose my project to the chancellor, you know, I ended up being a part of the Frederick Douglass project, you know? So it's fascinating because, you know, I'm still doing these things of marking black power and marking black empowerment, but I'm coming through it, do it through a different lens. You know what I'm saying? It's not the four original sites. So my buy-in in it, I guess, just to make sure I'm answering I'm talking question. about other people's buy-ins. So other people's buy-in, so other community like, like, members? Well, uh, yeah, for example, so what I'm getting at is um, every time you reclaim a space, you're yeah. unclaiming it for something else, right? Yeah. So it w used to be alumni field. Yeah. So I'm sure there are alumni who may have been not uh, as on board. Yeah. And I'm, question I'm wondering, how did that get negotiated? Is there another space being dedicated to alumni? Like, how is that? being handled or do you not know it? Well, actually with this, it was actually pretty straightforward, okay. right? I think maybe if the field had been named um, by a particular person. Right, with an endowment, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm sure we would have had a lot more discussions, right, about renaming the field. This is a little bit easier since it was called alumni field. I'm assuming there are multiple investors who helped create the field, mm -hmm. right? Uh, multiple alumni. Um, so there, it was a relatively straightforward process. A chancellor recommended it to the board of the university, and they were like, great, let's do it. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's so funny because like, <laughs> I always get like a little nervous when, when something's being pulled down or renamed um, because there's always like, you know, there's always a group that identifies with that somehow, and I thought yeah. that might have been the case here. But like, it turns out you had a relatively... Yeah. Seems like easy process doing that. Yeah, the only pushback we've had are individuals who are like, um, why are we honoring Douglas when we could be honoring, you know, this socialist organizer from Newark who did this? Or why aren't why aren't we naming it um, you know, so and so field? You know, they're like and I think in a lot of ways for those folks, they think like, oh, like, you know, we want to rename a field. Let's name it after someone rather than being a part of this monuments discussion, yeah. this national discussion and realizing that Frederick Douglass and this black community engage that space. Yeah. Newark has always had this interesting tradition of I mean, but we have, there's a lot of places named after local people. Um, but a lot of prominent spaces are actually named after individuals who are somewhat associated with this place. I mean, the most famous figure I could think of who visited here once famously, I, I think he's been here more than once, but there was one time he came that was like a big deal, and that's MLK, right? Yeah. He has a federal courthouse named after him. He has what used to be High Street, and High Street, I think it's lost on people nowadays, but if you live in England, it's like their way of saying Main Street. Mm -hmm. um, like High Street ran across from, the, you know, from all the way in the westward to... Um, you know, it's where the courthouse, the Essex County Courthouse is and along that whole road. That's MLK Boulevard. And he's not a, I wouldn't consider a Newark figure despite him having a historical presence in the city at one point. Um, and I liked your, your sort of comment from earlier about like sometimes you do need to use um, a prominent figure to get people to engage. Yeah. Because it's more easy to recognize Frederick Douglass than it is to pick 
you know, um, the who's the parish? The guy who ran the parish that you mentioned his name? Oh, Samuel Cornish. Yeah, Samuel Cornish, right? It, like, he's the founder of the first black African American newspaper in the United States. Oh, well, that, well, that's a crazy <laughs> No, but the funny thing is, like, that's the weird part about history. I mean, we've done yeah. a good job sometimes of bringing names that have kind of died out yeah. and revived them. Um, I think the Grimke sister, Grimke, Grimke, I can never pronounce it I right. I know. Someone the, always corrects me. Yeah, those sisters are getting more of a play now because they're just like insane. You know, like, yeah. you know, like the backstory, these are two women who uh, who were born into a slaveholding family, yeah. convert to Quakerism, yeah, convert despite to Quakerism. their parents like saying, we're going to disown you if you do that. And the fundamental tenet of Quakerism is you cannot own slaves. Like, you, this is, there's no way to, you and know. They're the leaders. They're the, the white leaders. Yeah, yeah. But like you know, the, like it, it, I'm wondering if Cornish will have his day in the sun at some point. And, and I understand why you named it after Douglas because you want a young, you know, seven year old, whether it's a black seven year old or a white seven year old, to be like, oh, I've heard that name before. Let me read this little sign here. Yeah. As opposed to being like, well, I don't know who that is, right? Like, yeah. Well, but and Frederick Douglass, he's you know he represents um, feminism, abolitionism, you know, complicated democracy. Yeah. Um, and. You know, to be frank, I mean, as far as the university for to to for Rutgers, um, he represents all of the things a university should represent, right? So dialogue, yeah. you know, disc, you know, discourse, um, activism, activism, writing, reading, um, communal discussions. I mean, he represents all those things, and actually, in like what my agenda has been of the Frederick Douglass Committee is to make sure that the African American community that um, Frederick Douglass visited, um, that they're represented. That that for me is the most important part of the story. That's why I'm on the the committee. That's why I go to weekly hour and <laughs> half meetings <laughs> when I'm working on a project about the 19th Amendment. I'm doing my own research. Um, you know, that's that's why I'm committed to this project for the past 13 months, and probably I'll be working on it for another 16 months. Um, and it's interesting, I just want to bring this up for folks to look at if they're curious about it. There's this white scholar, um, I can't remember his name now, he's done a whole project about Martin Luther King Boulevards across oh. the United States, and y'all just... <laughs> You will be amazed at all of the pushback on Martin Luther King Boulevards. I think folks of my generation uh, and then and Shirley, Manny um, and everybody else in here, you know, will not even understand like how prominent streets have in certain communities and even in white communities. They've attempted to name certain streets after Martin Luther King um, and it's failed. And, you know, a lot of black folks, we always make that joke. Oh, you know, the quote unquote worst part of the hood is always the MLK. But the reason he explains and you'll see Google just Google um, like marking MLK streets is because it's only in African-American communities where it can actually get passed. There are places around the country people were resisting their schools getting named after MLK, so on and so forth. And to be frank here, Mayor Sharp James actually was the only vote against High Street being named Martin Luther King Boulevard. Um, that was their second attempt to rename that street. Originally, they were going to name, I think it's Elizabeth Avenue, all of the people along Freeland Heisen going towards Elizabeth and that part of Newark were like, no, you'll destroy our businesses <laughs> by renaming this section Martin Luther King Boulevard. I'm just bringing this up for folks to understand this place debate is a big one. You know, it, 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 it speaks a lot about blackness, whiteness, communities, who we are, you know, and the fact that in a city like Newark, you know, the first attempt to name an avenue after Martin Luther King is basically tabled, you know, mm -hmm. for a couple of years. By the time it reaches, it comes up again. Is it under Gibson's administration that it gets renamed? or It's under um, the mayor's, I mean, Mayor Sharp James's. Oh, it was Sharp James's administration that they changed the name. Yeah, but the mayor was actually, Mayor Sharp James, and this might, I might be confused here, yeah. but Mayor Sharp James is actually against High Street being named Martin Luther King Boulevard for the reasons that Manny said. He felt like High Street was a historical space. Um, and he was like, why are we going to name it? 
And, you know, it's interesting because we think of Martin Luther King in such a, like, a beautiful way now. But there were people who fought against, you know, um, of how he was being positioned as a visionary and an idealist, even when he passed away, you know, in Mm -hmm. years, a couple of years after. It really took activists to really push King's image and his legacy into our communal imagination because otherwise, you know what, you know, folks might not even know that much about Martin Luther King now. You know, it's all activist work. Um, sorry, yeah, I was doing a quick search. I can't find it. Um, yeah. Even the, the NewarkHistory.com, which is like the first thing that comes up on Google, doesn't say when the name changed. Yeah. Um, but to close, out, to close out this discussion, um, I just want you to talk about your hopes now about mm. this space about the conversation moving forward. What what do you s- want to see come out of it? Okay. Um, well, I'm really excited about this Frederick Douglass marking. Um, I'm excited about my black abolitionist work. I look forward, I mean, even already, as far as the Underground Railroad and African Americans in Newark finding out about it, they just, folks are coming to the library they hear about it and they become so excited about it. You know, there's something about the Underground Railroad that really excites people beyond the intrigue of it. I mean, I think I think when we come to these ideas of courage and care, um, and I think what scholars are giving to this dialogue now is that it was African Americans who were pushing this <laughs> Underground Railroad, right? Um, reimagining abolitionists, right? Generally, we're thinking of like white guys and white women in armchairs. Um, but black abolitionists are like folks on the street, you know, who are starting these schools. They're trying to get food for the, and, and, you know, the fugitive enslaved. I mean, I didn't even think about it before I started this project. But when you ran away from a plantation, you needed clothes, you needed money, you needed food, you needed all of these things. So I'm working on this Black Abolitionist Project. I look forward to the tours. I'm going. I'm doing virtual installations. I'm reimagining spaces and photographs, and it's going to be amazing. The um, exhibition is scheduled for 2021 at the library. Another project that I'm doing that I'm working on is we're looking at the 19th Amendment next year is the centennial celebrating the women's vote. Mm -hmm. But the way I'm the curator and researcher for that, that's going to be at Newark Public Library. It's a traveling exhibition. If you guys are interested in having your school take the exhibition, we will send it there. And one of the things with that is we're looking at the ways that women and co- women of color were engaged in the dialogue. I mean, frankly, even though in the 19, in 1920, women received the right to vote, black women really don't have um, the bars pulled away from voting until the 60s, you right. know, um, Native American women, you know. Um, so I'm excited about that and that project. And what I'm hoping over the next couple of years um, with my work, the work that the Clement Price Institute is doing around dispossessed people, Native Americans in this region, is that we are going to um, bring the truth of what, these regions like Newark, Jersey City, what the truth of this experience was for African Americans, radical whites, um, Native Americans, um, and we're going to have a different understanding of community. That's my hope. Um, so I think you may have preempted me, but I, I want to close out um, the episode with what I close out every episode with, uh-huh. which is what you're excited for in Newark, <laughs> sort of something that's going on that you want to share. Um, let's see. I mean, I'm Like I said, I'm always excited about my projects. What I'm excited about is folks just getting excited always about culture, um, about art, about history, um, people having conversations about things, about what does it mean to be queer, um, talking about gentrification here, what is placement? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? Um, that folks are re, uh, re-entering these conversations. I've been an activist since I was 13 years old. I mean, I co-founded an LGBT group <laughs> at my mm-hmm. high school. I was the president of Women of Color junior year in my high school. So I've been working on these issues for a long time. But my investment has always been, how do people have conversations about it? 
right? Yeah. And so in Newark, to see that we're even having these public conversations, um, we have the LGBT Center. Um, the mayor actually has to develop a position against um, gentrification. Um, and I, 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 I don't understand some of his arguments, but you know that he has to respond to these things shows that there's some kind of public discussion going on. And that's very exciting for a person like me who's been invested in these conversations. Like to hear the words like when I was in my 20s, only activists are using words like police brutality and white supremacy, you know. And now we're on blogs where, you know, 20 year olds are using, you know, all of these different terms are in engaging in a civic discourse. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> mine is on a very different note. Uh, so by the time this podcast comes out, it already have happened. But Sunday is my annual picnic, which everyone in this room is invited to. What? Um, oh. Oh, I do it in Branchwick Park. Um, just, I got I hope it doesn't rain. Um, <laughs> um, and I hope the, the, the cherry blossoms. The dark ones have blossomed, but the light blush pink ones haven't yet. Yes. And I'm hoping that by this Sunday they'll, they'll be out. Um, but I love doing it because I make these um, special sandwiches that are waffles with fried chicken <laughs> in the middle and like a nice sauce on the side. It's just great. Ooh, maybe, um, maybe we'll come by. Yeah, no, we'll, um, I usually post the location because you know how crazy it gets up in yes. Branchwick Park, particularly the festival weekend. Um, so I'll Google Earth the location for those who were invited on Facebook. Yeah. Um, but uh, maybe next year I'll make it a bigger event and invite all the pod listeners, all, all of you mm -hmm. out there, the, the hundreds and thousands of you out yeah. there I, that I like to imagine that are out there. Um, so, um, I want to thank, uh, Noelle Lorraine Williams for coming on yes, today. thank you for um, having me. No, no problem. Um, I, uh, just want to make sure I get this right. So this Wednesday, April yes. 17th. So this Wednesday, April 17th at 2.30, if you go to maybe like Rutgers Today or you just Google the event, Google Frederick Douglass, um, um, April 17th. Um, you will be able to um, register and come. Um, right now, we have like 400 people coming. I think our max is like 500. But just come. I mean, it's like, when do you have the opportunity to just like commemorate black activism, you know? Um, and I'm just, I'm so, I'm just, <laughs> I'm so excited for all of us, you know? I, I'm hoping that even with like African American history and soon we'll have more about like immigration in New Jersey and Newark. Um, we'll have scholars who will look at, you know, like what poor women, I mean, I just, I think, I think there's opportunity to just spark so many people. So I'm excited. Thank you, Noel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is Manny Antunes, host and producer of the Pot and Market podcast, editing and sound engineering by Byphrase. Uh, podcast logo and design provided by Robert Conti. Additional creative input by Samantha Cateis. Pod intro and outro music by Dan Myler. If you have a subject you would like to hear discussed on this podcast, please email podandmarket at gmail.com or contact the pod through social media. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. April is National Poetry Month, one of my favorite months. Um, I oftentimes put quotes on Facebook and I'm going to bring you a quick, very fast poem from one of my favorite collections. It's called uh, Half Light, uh, the collected poems of Frank Bedar from 1965 to 2016. Uh, it's a really cool um, book of poetry over um, one person's lifetime. Um, and the name of this poem is Homo Faber. Whatever lies still uncarried from the abyss within me as I die, dies with me. Thank you. Thank you.